Hello, welcome to another Camera Pro on the couch. Um, just before we begin, um, if anyone has any comments or questions they would like to ask Andy for this evening, please don't be shy and put them in the comments section. Um, we'll try and get to them best we can throughout the course of the evening. Well, uh, welcome again, and we have a very special guest on tonight, someone a little bit different to what we've usually done in photographers and videographers. We've actually got a cinematographer on tonight. Um, so without further ado, I will bring in um, Andy, but this is a man that's been confirmed dead by the Australian government, met people like Will Cowell, Chris Hemsworth, Ray Martin, Sir David Attenborough, Andy Denton, just to name a few. He's been to North Korea, Russia, Af Afghanistan, the Gaza Strip, and also Bikini Atoli. Um, I'll probably butcher that last one, but I'll let uh, Andy speak a bit more. And thanks for joining us tonight, Andy. Really appreciate it. All right, how are you going? Now, we haven't had a cinematographer on before. Um, if you want to give us a brief insight to what a cinematographer does, um, and then we'll, we'll touch a bit on, on your personal life as well. Well, I suppose a cinematographer is really, it's just, I mean, I, I, I sort of, when people ask what I do, I say I'm a cameraman, which is kind of really what, what I am. But I, I think um, mm. to a lot of people, cameraman is just someone who stands behind a studio camera or out, you know, out of the footy pointing a camera and yep. is, um, is di directed and told what to do and has someone, you know, do, doing the fine tuning of the camera and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, all they're really doing is focusing and, and picture composition. So, um I suppose a cinematographer is, is to me someone who is more of a, um, a lighting cameraman, as I, the English call um, uh, guys who are out in the field, a field crews who um, who, who carry a light kit and a camera. And mm. um, uh, it's more about lighting and um, thinking about sequences and how to shoot things. And it's yeah. kind of a, just a kind of a little bit more kind of um, I don't know uh, arty and sort of a bit, bit more respectful. I think than just calling yourself a cameraman or mm. a videographer. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, um, don't think it quite does it justice. Obviously, we'll be touching on your journey in, in that field. But absolutely, I, I think cinematographer is a guy that's usually behind the scenes. Obviously, tonight, you're very much in front of the camera, which mm. must be a bit of a different experience for you. Oh, yeah, I've done a few of these, but um, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really love being on this side of the camera. <laughs> I prefer to be over there, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, awesome, Andy. Well, tell, tell us a bit about your journey in cinematography or videography in general. Um, I've read obviously a little bit into yourself. Um, did it start from a pretty early age? Um, where, when did you start to realize the camera was starting to call to you a little bit? Um, well, I suppose when I was at high school, I, um, I, I was kind of interested in photography and uh, mm -hmm. I was at a very kind of footy kind of rugby kind of school and I wasn't very good at sports. So I ended up, yep. you know, videoing and taking photos of the footy um, uh, at, uh, at school. Um, and in the I, AV room sort of situation. Exactly. A bit of one that, yep. you know, those nerdy guys at, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I, I eventually um, uh, went to see, a, I think it was a, maybe about 18, I went to see a film called, I think it was called Salvador. Um, yep. Uh, which was a, you know, a war kind of um, thing in, set in, in uh, Central America. And yeah. uh, I, it was about a photojournalist. And I thought, oh, that looks like a really cool job. So I um, yeah. went out and bought myself a, a Nikon FE2. I think I've still got it here at home. Um, nice and put into photography, bought a dark room. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to process and print my own, own photos. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually uh, applied for a job at the ABC. Um, yep. uh, got that. 1986, I started at the ABC, ended up uh, staying there for 25 years, um, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Used to be, well, it probably still is, but. Um, it was a brilliant uh, place to, to learn, and, and, and their training uh, was was fan, you know, like just unbelievable. Uh, we mm. we had um, uh, lots and lots of studio crews, OB crews, and a cine camera department. So, so I started in the studio and shot um, uh, Play School, you know, Mr. Squiggle, some of the um, you know just the news readers and just the basic stuff in the studio for three years. Mm -hmm. Ended mm -hmm. up in the cine camera department, which was um, at that time uh, for about 30 crews who were shooting film and yep. about 30 crews who were shooting video, which had kind of just started for news mm -hmm. and current affairs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a few years later, I ended up in the in the ABC's Moscow Bureau as, the, as a cameraman there, cameraman editor, mm -hmm. um, and then went to London, the London Bureau after that. So I traveled around Europe, the Middle East and, um, and Africa quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Came home, worked at Four Corners um, for 12 years. Uh, 
and eventually 60 Minutes called and I um, went, went over to Channel 9, uh, stayed there about eight years and since uh, leaving Channel 9, I think I've been freelance for roughly about six or seven years now. So yeah. I bought my own, had to buy my own gear and um, start looking after it and um, and uh, um, I've got a, you know quite a good kit now and a, and a good mm. kind of client base, if you like. Is I guess one of the arguments that people don't or, or maybe a bit hesitant to go into that freelance sort of industry and, and go it alone, is it more, is it not so much skill-based because obviously you've acquired all those skills throughout the years, is it more so building up a, a, a gear list that you're happy with where you can say, I can sort of do this alone now? Yeah, well, so there are a couple of things to work out. One is whether I can afford to leave a full-time job and, you know, whether mm-hmm. I had enough would have enough work to, you know, pay the bills. Mm-hmm. Um, it took a while. It takes a while to get going, obviously. You know, it takes, you know, a, a bit of time to, to build up a few few sure. production companies. And, and most of mm-hmm. my, um, the, you know, producers I work with, most of them are old mates of mine that used to work at the ABC or Channel 9 or mm-hmm. Channel 7. So, um, um, so I found it pretty easy to, to get, to find the work. Um, yeah. It's really... Um, about you know well or getting the gear is obviously not that not that big a deal it's um just a matter mm-hmm. of borrowing the money really and then paying it off slowly um yeah. you know buying camera car and all that sort of stuff is is just one of the things you have to do to make it work sure. um and eventually i think i found out there was there's actually kind of easy to make i could work fewer hours mm. and make the same amount of money and pick and choose um the work i was oh, doing nice. and the trips i yeah. wanted to do and i could say no to things um working for myself effectively not 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 sort of a slave to you know the networks mm, definitely um i guess and that's obviously evident in sort of the last recent um work you've been doing obviously very very cool stuff which we'll touch on as well soon mm-hmm. um when you first obviously shooting starting out you said you got the the nikon fe2 film camera um yep what what separated you from going down the photography path more so and and more into the video side of things? Um, oh, look, I just used to see, you know, news cameramen in, you know, when I was, before I was became a cameraman, I used to see news camera. Mm. I thought it was a really cool job and the, uh, there was travel, variety, something different, you know, you meet new people, go to yep. exciting places. So um, uh, I thought like, you know, I, I was interested in news and, and like doing something different every day and going to work and not knowing what I'd be doing mm. as opposed to um, even – you know, a lot of my colleagues work on um, TV commercials or dramas or um, reality yep. TV. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not really kind of interested in working in massive crews um, mm. uh, with a lot of people where you know there are streets of uh, long, lots of trucks, grip trucks and gaffer trucks, and you know in the street uh, we're kind of a small cog and um, I'd prefer to work in a small team of normally there's three or four of us, a producer and maybe an on-air person, a producer, a reporter mm. or or a presenter and a sound recorder, if I'm lucky. Um, occasionally a second camera, maybe an assistant um, every now and then, but um, it's normally just myself and a producer and sound and a presenter. So four of us traveling, which is the way that mm. uh, we used to operate at 60 minutes. Sure. And is it a similar sort of crew that you like to venture out with? Have you got like a, a pretty strong network on the people you prefer to work with? Yeah, most of the people I work with now are actually pretty much X, X, ABC or X channel line, um, mm. sort of branched out themselves and, uh, working in little production companies. Um, I, I, I've been back at the ABC a little bit lately. I did a, there's actually a show on tonight, I think called, um, Catalyst. It's about the trees, Australia's favorite tree. I did a couple of episodes of that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, a couple of years ago, I spent a year and a half, 18 months filming, uh, a three part series on Luna park, um, the ghost train fire for the ABC, which, mm-hmm. um, did really well yep. um in the meantime i've just been doing docos with i've got you know mates who are, who are max utrich and who used to be my boss at the abc and ray martin um uh and a few ex abc reporters who i um and producers who i still work with um i like just like working with fun people and having a good time mm. and uh not you know not stress out at work and not um not work too hard but have a good you know have a bit of yeah. a yeah Eagle. Surrounded with people that obviously are going to work hard, um, who you trust. Obviously, that's probably a big thing in your industry yeah. as well. Someone that you can depend on. People especially. who know what they're doing. Yeah, that not you know. There's a lot of you know. Uh, I find there's a lot of um, inexperienced people out there who can just kind of bluff their way through. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas um, I just prefer to work with even if, if you don't, if you don't know what you're doing and you're not if you're unsure about what sort of shots or how to shoot a sequence, I prefer just 
for them to ask and we could just you know work, work something out together collaborate rather than um, have people kind of bluff their way through yes certainly touching back on your early stages of your career um, as well Andy um, you started obviously quite modestly in, in some ways in what you were filming I guess so obviously you were doing quite high scale production sort of work but you were doing something maybe that was far different from what you ended up ultimately doing so we're talking about Mr Squiggle we're talking about play school and then we're talking about entering the war front essentially not long after it's quite yeah, a contrast we'll of, of, of the two what what drove you towards that path well, to be honest, the, the, the most important thing to me was just to get a foot in the door at, at, at a, you know, one of the networks. Um, mm. And I, was, I tried plenty of times at Channel 7, 9 and 10, and they kept knocking yep. me back. I was applying for jobs as, you know, cleaner and storeman and that sort of stuff. Eventually, the ABC mm -hmm. um, gave me a job. And to do that, I had to um, be um, uh, in the process of, of doing a film and TV course at, at TAFE, at, you know, North Sydney Technical College mm -hmm. there, um, mm -hmm. which was – the only reason they they um, offered me a sort of a traineeship, yeah, a studio right. government. Um, so that was my foot in the door. And once you're inside the, um, you know, the organisation, it's a bit easy to move around. So I did studio mm. camera for a while, which was very very good training. We used to um, we used to pan and tilt the camera and follow. They used to swing a, a shot bag, you know, a, a sandbag yep. from one of the lighting buttons. You have to follow that, and it was very good <laughs> training. Um, you know, just this is really simple stuff, and all you had to do with the um as a studio camera was to pit, was to frame the shot up to, and picture composition was, was very important and focused. But um, the CCU guy upstairs took care of the, um, the uh, exposure and the color mm -hmm. and the lighting guy took care of it. So it was really, you know, it was a very, very good training around just, just learning the basic skills of, um, uh, of, um, you know, camera work uh, yep. until it became second nature really. Mm -hmm. um, and so moving into news was um, uh, getting out in the field was a bit more exciting for me. Um, I think I, um, you know, and obviously you have to, you know, light your light everything yourself, and um, there's a lot more to think about, and you're on the move. So um, uh, it was a big step up to um, to to go from a studio cameraman to a to a news cameraman, and then Absolutely. another step again. There was a kind of a career path uh, um, at the ABC. You started in news, and you do nightly current affairs like seven thirty, and then eventually um, a longer format, um, four corners, foreign correspondent shows like that. Um, you could work in documentaries eventually. So um, there was a, a good range of programs there at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and at that stage, you were using quite obviously different gear to what you transitioned into later in your career. You had one of those big, what are they called, LDK5s, um, massive tubular type camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't, we, didn't, we didn't really use the L L L Oh, the LDK5 is, it was the studio camera, yeah. Uh, mm. But uh, we, we started down in... Um, in cine camera, we started with tube beta cams. I think they were called BVP threes or something, which are the he yeah, big right. heavy things with a recorder docked on the back that you know uh, you couldn't replay out of, and uh, yeah. you know you just line the three tubes up every morning, and um, uh, yeah, a bit of a punish. Uh, eventually, yeah. CCD cameras, and then uh, Digi Beta and HD Cam and XD Cam, and all the Sony kind of uh, you know um, products that came out. Um, mm. I've got you know I've got Canon gear now. Um, uh, lots of Canon gear, and mm. um, you know it's just it's just reliable and works, and the customer service is fantastic. I can see um, through a bit of my reading that you've you've you're pretty happy with the service that a CPS provides, Canon Professional Services. Have they helped you out in in a lot of situations when you've yeah, wanted to buy gear or needed gear? Uh, yeah, every all the time. You know, Colin mm. at CPS in Sydney and um, at you know Sun Studios is always they've always got. A, a stack of lenses there for me available on loan and if my mm. camera breaks down or needs a uh, you know a sensor clean they'll loan me a new a, a replacement camera until it's fixed so it's um it's second to none you know customer service if you ask me i'm mm. a massive fan yeah great and and what sort of oh, they, don't, they don't pay me by the way i, I don't get any i'm just just telling you <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. And like I've, I've read a bit into it and it's, it's more so for you, again, another trust thing, right? It's a brand name you trust, a brand name that not only does the lenses, does the camera bodies, um, does a great service. Like obviously it incorporates a, a number of features for you that enough to go, you're a, a loyal Canon user essentially. 
Yeah, I just think, look, the, one of the most important things for me is to have, um, I mean, when we did multi-camera shoots, you had two or three cameras um, just to get the pictures to match. And it was very difficult um, in the early days. Now, um, uh, the colour science with the Canon cameras especially is so good. Um, mm. I can match up at a, a, C, C, sure. a C500 here, a Mark II and a, um, a, a C70 and a, this is a um, uh, R5C that I'm mm. using to, for this Zoom thing now, this um, streaming thing. Um and they're all, you know, they're all just um, the menu, menus are easy and the, and the colour science is fantastic. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And just touching on gear now, like, have you seen obviously quite a, a massive shift from what you were using earlier in your career to n now what you're currently using? Obviously, there's great cine cameras that are quite pocket size now. Like, you've got the R5C, you've got the C70. Um, mm -hmm. You've got some pretty small cameras that do pack a pretty hell of a punch, especially compared yeah. to 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, look, I, I used my C500 Mark II pretty much 95% of the time um, with mm. the, the Canon Cine Prime lenses. Um, yep. My C70 is like basically a sort of second locked off camera, which I'd, if I was doing an interview, I'd have that in a second, um, like on the, a wider shot or a second, an alternate angle. And mm -hmm. the and the R5C here, I um I use um I don't use it, you know probably I don't probably don't use it very much at all to be honest. But it's um it's mm -hmm. a really good little camera to have um in your back pocket if you need a third camera. Or the other day I had it mounted on a, on the on the windscreen of a car to do a driving um, piece to camera for with Ray. Um, uh, it's it's like it's fantastic. I need to. Uh, I don't know you, we all view viewers be familiar with it, but you know it's um it hasn't it doesn't have internal NDs. And the batteries don't last as long, so yep. at the moment I've got this one plugged into my MacBook um, USB charger, which that'll mm -hmm. go forever. Um, and I've got some screw-on uh, variable NDs to pull the, um, you know, to be able to shoot at uh, a smaller um, aperture. Yeah, cool. And I guess before we get into like your favourite bits of gear and, and lenses and what you would probably advise people starting out with, but. Um, has that changed has the change in gear changed the way we we, we shoot as a cinematographer uh, as such like are you kind of like a guy that can kind of do everything now that you uh, you know you don't need the whole crew anymore or is it still very much so you still have those dependable guys on on set doing the various different things oh look i think you still only do one 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 thing at a time which is to operate yeah. the camera and the light um having i mean i'd the last couple of weeks I've been doing sound by myself because we've been flying around in choppers and it was a remote mm. um, location. So instead of um, a producer or a sound recorder, we took uh, I took a second um, camera along, Roger Price, who uh, who was mainly doing kind of, he's got the same gear as me, so we could yep. do alternate angles, different lenses. He was flying the drone when I was, you know. So um, we, it was like a two-camera shoot. We kind mm. of managed sound ourselves. It was a bit of a punish yep. um, using these little, um, you know, these little road um and the uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. goes go tos, um, yeah. and they're okay. Um, uh, I've obviously got a, you know a decent boom pole with a electrosonic link back to the camera, which is um, which is our you know main um, kind of bit of audio kit, I suppose. Um, it's a bit of a punish having to do sound. I don't like it. Um, my wife normally does sound with me, um, and um, uh, look, I think it's probably it's not. And it's possible to do more on your own. I often do two or three camera shoots by myself, and mm -hmm. um, uh, but I prefer not to. Um, the main difference between the gear now and what we were using, I don't know, say twenty years ago, is that the sensors are much bigger. Like instead of um, you know, the old mm -hmm. um, Digibeta or um, you know, um, HD cam, XD cam, uh, two third inch uh, sensors, yeah, we've cool. now got full frame sensors on the on you know this camera and the C500. Um, yeah. I've also got a, um, uh, a bunch of, you know, really good fast lenses. So I like, mm. I like big, big sensors, uh, uh, very fast lenses and, uh, yep. and operating with a minimal uh, depth of field generally. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And that would have, that would have been quite different, uh, vastly different to maybe how the style of sh shot you were doing 10, 15 years ago. Cause obviously sensor size will come into the depth of field a little bit too. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. faster the lenses, also um, will give you obviously that depth of field as well. But things like face and eye tracking now is something that you can kind of depend on a little bit more yeah. than using uh, fast lenses back in the day and not sure whether they're hitting focus or not is probably yeah. I use some the, issue um, as well. On these cameras, I use the 
face and I detect all the time. I think it's on mm. now. Actually. Um, I can't mm. quite see it. But I'm pretty sure it'll be on now. Hopefully I'm in focus. Um, but <laughs> yeah. generally speaking, I use prime lenses. So there it's all manual focus, manual iris. Um, uh, so it just depends, just depends on what you're shooting and, um, how much time you've got a lot of, you know, a lot of the time it's, um, based on, you know, um, you know, the pressures of, um, you know, when the talent's available and how much, um, setup time you have, how many lights mm. you can set up, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, definitely. Um, speaking of home life, um, as well, you're obviously married as well. Any kids? Uh, yeah, my wife has three and I have three. Yeah. So six. Yeah. They're all, um, all grown up now 18 to 28 yeah, mm -hmm. yeah massive family and yeah. and was that something i guess starting out that was a little tough to deal with the homesickness side of things has that been something that's been constant throughout your career yeah, I don't, actually you know what I, i'm going away for four weeks on a shoot <laughs> coming up i'm not looking forward to being away from home for for that mm. long um I, I i it was exciting at first and after a while it's um i mean i used to at 60 minutes we were away from mm. home at least six months of the year it was a long Jeez. you know trips yeah. to four, four to six weeks um and uh it, it it's difficult and it's um tiring but um uh you know thanks to you know it's been going on for the last couple of years there's not um hasn't been as much travel so mm. uh, it's been fairly a bit, bit more of a relaxed pace lately yeah and obviously that's brought a, f a bit more work to australian shores as well for for, for video and and for movie wise a um, mm, bit, mm. bit more local talent also representing um as well and maybe focusing on a few passion projects that way you've mm. done some recent stuff with um chris hemsworth um and was it mick fanning as well i think i saw yeah i did um i did a, a shoot with a 60 minutes with mick fanning a while ago just I think the first surf he had after he was attacked by the shark in South Africa mm. and we we're in the water up, uh, up your way, actually, uh, yeah. around about, where were we? Um, oh, just north of Byron somewhere. And we were yep. in the water with him. We had a drone in the air. We had a, a camera in the water and I was like on the back of a jet ski filming him and wow. uh, for his very first surf after the attack and uh, this fin popped up right next to him and he almost, <laughs> you know, almost walked on water to get out of the, get back to the yeah. beach. Um, no, and then I ran into him again. Um, I was doing a, a um, I was doing second camera with um, uh, Chris Hemsworth on a, 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 a Disney Plus uh, doco called Shark Beach, which Jules mm -hmm. O'Loughlin was DOPing. And oh, yeah. uh, so I was kind of like second camera on that. And uh, mm -hmm. thanks, thanks for that, Jules. That was a really great gig. And um, there's a few weeks there with um, those guys. They're really good blokes. Chris and, uh, and, and Mick Fanning was there at the same, same beach. Mm -hmm. I said, mate, is this the same place we were when we. Um, Saw that fin pop up, and he went, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." I was gonna, I was gonna mention that, but yeah, it was um, <laughs> pretty, yeah, pretty hairy. Yeah, epic, epic. Um, now touching back to your earlier career, um, and going into the war zone, um, you've had you've had some pretty hectic moments over your career as well, especially just reading some of the stuff you encountered basically in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, oh. You were de de declared dead by the Australian government um in the early 90s yeah i, I was reminded of that the other day actually because mm. um it's uh, a foreign correspondent had their i think their 30th anniversary um and uh at that stage i was working at the abc moscow bureau and you know way before mobile phones or uh satellite phones or mm. you know there was no communication in the field whatsoever we were in this little um little town um in a place called abkhazi which is a breakaway kind of part of georgia which is south of russia on the black sea and yep somehow long story uh, short but um somehow we were um we were meant to be on a plane that was shot down and i was actually on the front line at the time and i saw the plane splash into the water by the time i spun the camera around to get a shot it had it had sort of uh ditched but um yeah somehow the australian government uh had figured out that we we're on that plane and our um you know the abc the abc's foreign editor john teller who sadly passed away a couple of days ago mm -hmm. uh, and my uh, my next of kin family were informed um uh, that we would be confirmed dead by the Australian government. So um, uh, for a few days, uh, yeah, it was a bit uh, bit of a worry for them, but um, Definitely. thankfully, still here. Just just a bit of a worry. Um, were you were you married at that time? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That was my first marriage. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, that, yeah. that's that's epic. And obviously, going on from that as well, um, you've had you've encountered other things as well. You've been kidnapped by the KGB. 
Oh, when I say kidnapped, it was like it was it was a very temporary thing. Uh, a bit like being uh, uh, um, well, we weren't kidnapped by the cage. We were kind of arrested by them for we were filming secretly filming uh, Russian Soviet submarines in Vladivostok, and uh, they didn't. They didn't I, I wouldn't go back there right now. It's probably a bit more of a punish um, uh, to travel yeah. through Russia now. Um, I lived yeah. there for a bit over twelve months, and um, it was fun when the wall, you know, when the, the Soviet Union was breaking up, and mm. it was um, it was like the wild wild west. But um. Uh, I wouldn't be back there right now. It um, doesn't sound like it's very friendly. But, um, no. yeah, no, we, we were sort of arrested by the KGB. And um, uh, when I was based in London, I was um, kind of kidnapped by the IRA, but, again, sort of very temporary and um, uh, almost set up to um, – uh, but, yeah, being thrown in the back of a van with a bunch of blokes in balaclavas in the car park of a pub in um, in, in a Northern Ireland is, um, is, is a bit frightening at the time, but they were actually quite – quite friendly in the end but you, you, you probably don't really know what's going on. like is there in the back of your mind a bit more so of that worry that you you might not get out of a sticky situation well i think in those days to be honest before you know september 11 being an australian tv crew was actually a bit of a you know a, like a free pass you, you could kind of almost do anything um as soon as you right. said you're a media and you're from australia and you're here to tell their side of the story I was, it was, it was, I mean, it was, it was frightening, sometimes terrifying, but, but generally speaking, it was, um, you know, we felt protected, um, just with, you know, by, by saying we're Australian, um, not mm. really, not really the case anymore. Did you have, did you have, um, I guess a bit of a larger than life feel during that time? Like, is there something that gave you that steely confidence to, to fully charge into those kind of situations? Well, weirdly, um, you know, weirdly, uh, you kind of when you get to somewhere, you go somewhere a bit, a little bit dodgy. So, for example, mm. you know, Rwanda or parts of Africa, um, mm. or um, uh, okay, for example, um, uh, the Moscow. There was a Moscow uprising, and uh, it was actually, it's actually exactly thirty years ago, ninety two, ninety three, I think it was, where they were firing tanks at the parliament. Um, and the rebels stormed the, uh, tried to storm the Soviet, um, or the, the Russian TV station. Um, mm. uh, we had flak jackets on and we were kind of cruising around filming, but the kind of closer you get, the more you th safe you feel. It's a really weird kind of situation to be in, but you, the closer you are, the, the, you feel a bit safer and you want to go a bit further right. still and further and further until all of a sudden you realize, you know, you're in the wrong spot. Um, mm. uh, when they, when they attacked, the rebels attacked the TV station, we we're outside with a bunch of like hundreds of rebels and, mm. uh, I didn't, I didn't, you know, realize at the time, no one, I don't think anyone realized there were a um, about, I think, a couple of hundred uh, uh, Russian, uh, they call it Oman, which is the, the um, ex, um, uh, or the, the Russian, uh, what would you call them, like a riot, riot squad, police riot squad. And so and they, right. they basically just opened up with force. automatic weapons on the crowd. And um, yeah, I was talking to a British cameraman, Rory Peck, who was, who was shot and killed at the, you know, right, right there in front of me. And um, I think seven journos were killed at that, you know, in that. In that situation, it was um, yeah. it's kind of uh, terrifying, but um, uh, you know, I just sort of feel lucky to you know get it, get get you know that I'm still yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, touching on Rory Peck uh, as well, that has now obviously that instance has turned been turned into a bit of an award as well um for very talented cinematographers and cameramen that go into the heat of battle to capture very important pieces of footage um and you've actually won that award as well did that mean no, 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 a lot not the, the rory peck um uh trust runs the rory peck awards i think they're still going i'm not too sure i'm not um really up to date but uh mm. that was for freelance cameramen based around the world who who you know who went in to do um dangerous and uh, brave um uh filming i think it's i think it's mainly tv camera work there may be some stills uh um involved as well but uh yeah i'm not even too sure that it's still up and running but um yeah the rory peck award was um was a big deal mm, absolutely and that's something you've 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 won as well no no i know i've known no, the rory peck because I, I was a staff person then so that was at the time right. was for freelance um camera and, um, you know, mainly in kind of third world countries who were going in and filming things that were um, that the, the networks, you know, ABC America, NBC, CNN were wouldn't send their own crews in to cover. Right. right. Now my awards um, were all, 
or all, um, AB, uh, the ACS, Australian Cinematographer Society Awards mainly. Mm. After a situation like that and, and getting home, does that, does that change, I guess, the, the way you approach future jobs that you select? Is, or is that something that's changed your opinion on the fragility of, of man or of, of life after yeah, a situation? Really, I, and I, I kind of, I just sort of generally speaking, move on. I just, I, you finish one job and next thing you know, you're somewhere else and you, mm. you kind of leave it behind. Uh, and it's probably the best you know, way of dealing with you know. If, for your mental health at least sure. um, just to move on and not linger on, you know, what could have happened or how dodgy it was or, you know, yeah. um, but, but, you know, um, for us, I suppose we're, we're kind of lucky because we, we breeze into these places and we film for you know, a week or two weeks or mm. not. And we, but we, and we can get on a plane and leave. Whereas um, the locals, especially our, you know, our local drivers and translators and fixers that we use, they, 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 they stay there. Um, but um Look, you know, I don't think that sort of stuff's never really bothered me. Um, and I don't, mm. I don't, to be honest, I don't really do it anymore. Sure. Did you make any, I guess, changes in how you prepare yourself? I've got a, just a question um, from PBJ here. How do you prepare yourself for these kinds of dangerous trips? Uh, is there anything you kind of do a bit differently or you just take on board advice from the various governments around the world? How does it sort of operate when you're going into a dangerous location? Um, it depends if you're working for a network, if you're working for a network, you've kind of got, you've got they're, they're really, they're looking after you and they've got people back, back home or you've got mm. a, a better support network, I suppose. Um, if you're working for a network, as opposed to being a freelancer on the ground on your own. Um, yep. so we would, um, for example, um, at the ABC and 60 minutes, we do, um, hostile environment courses, battlefield, um, survival courses. I did a nuclear chemical biological warfare course before the first Gulf war. Yes. Um, mm. So they, they, they prepare you um, and they give you the right gear, flak jackets and chemical suits and, and the right boots and, you know, all the, all the kit. But um, uh, I think really in the end, you've just got to go with people you trust and, 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 and uh, senior respected journalists and producers who mm. know what they're doing and uh, rely on them organising good fixes and people on the ground to look after you um, mm. And travelling with you know minimal minimal kit really you know so you're not you know, sort of we're stuck with a thousand cases I try and uh, travel with what I can fit on one airport trolley generally speaking. Hmm. Absolutely. Um. I guess another quite a unique opportunity uh, in your locations across the world. Obviously, I've, I touched on it a little bit at the start on the places you have been. Um. North Korea, and that's something that probably you know. Not yeah, many not people sure. at all, especially media, no, have, um, have, yeah, been, no, have was, the privilege to go to. You want yeah, to tell us a bit wild. about that experience? Yeah, look, we, um, oh, it was again another 60 Minutes. But 60 Minutes gave us so many amazing, you know, opportunities and mm. trips and with, you know, incredible, like unbelievable um, access to people and, and locations. Um, so North Korea was one of them. And um, uh, we, uh, Tom Steinberg was a reporter at the time, uh, and uh, Chick, who was my soundo, and Stephen Tal was a producer. The four of us were uh, were invited as a crew. They in, invite, I think, one foreign crew per year to come to to go to North Korea, and they show you around. And um, uh, it was yeah, it was it was weird. Um, I took t- about twenty four cans of baked beans and ate them cold in my room every night. There was no phone, no satellite phone. We were allowed in with our laptops, but um, uh, your phone clearly didn't work there. There was no communication with the, with the outside world, and the place was like so grey and bland. Um, there were like um, North Korean spies uh, following us everywhere. There was, uh, they, were, they, were, they guided us around to um, what they called, um, uh, you know, um, typical um, North like Korean tourists. apartments and uh, yeah. shops. And it was all just, it was just, it was just Hollywood. It was just like all made, made so made up, it was so obvious. Um, but uh, the place was, uh, it was really interesting to, to visit. Um, uh, um, and then they took us down to the, um, the border with South Korea and uh, mm. um, they, were, they, they showed us around. They were fairly nice to us, um, but um, um, it was a difficult shoot because um, it was so, um, you know, managed by uh, their own, um, you know, public affairs, if mm. you like, team. Um, there would have been, we had a bus and there were four of us and there would have been a, you know, maybe eight or ten uh, minders with us watching everything we did. Mm. Mm. Jeez. Um, touching on 60 Minutes obviously gave you a pretty exclusive trip around the world in some regards. Um, 
Bikini at Atoll. At all, Bikini at all, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to tell us a bit about that experience? Because like you were one of the the rare people that actually got an exclusive license, I guess, to to travel it's, there and film there. It's a difficult place to get to because Bikini Atoll is where the uh, you, uh, the, the Americans rather um, used to do all their um, above ground nuclear tests, and they had Marshall uh, Islands, yeah. Well, Marshall Islands, yeah. So it was mm. a trip. We flew Sydney, um, Brizzy, uh, I think Townsville, then to Guam, and then there was a little island hopping plane, uh, Milk Run, that um, I think uh, Marshall Islands was like third or fourth or fifth um, island on the trip. So we, then we hopped off there. So it took us two days to get to Marshall Islands and another, I think it was like 20 or 30 hours in a boat to get out to Bikini Atoll. Yes. And we were diving um, uh, on... Uh, on wrecks, uh, and the, the water is supposed to be radioactive. There's no one lives there at all. Um, uh, it's the most beautiful life? place. It's the most amazing, amazingly beautiful, um, you know, um, location. Mm. Just the sand was so white. The water was so blue. It was like, it was just the most perfect place, but, uh, you know, super radioactive. So we mm. didn't stay. We stayed a couple of days there, but uh, we were diving to, I think the, uh, the deck of the, um, I'm not sure which ship it was called, the USS something or other, um, mm. which was a uh, aircraft carrier. That was, I think, 55 metres deep. Um, quite a few sharks down there, but, you know, mm. just incredible um, uh, experience. And I was, I was really lucky because I, at the time I joined 60 Minutes, the, one of the guys, the, the only guy who used to dive um, had, had left. So they said, we'll put you on a dive course. And within the first 12, 12 months, I'd been to six of the best dive locations in the world. Yeah, that, w- that would have been one of them. And and you you have done some some stuff in uh, scuba diving elements as well. So you've got your your license and your certification. How have you found time to be able to juggle all these things? Has it kind of been like one opportunity presents, I guess, another for you? Well, to be honest, sixty minutes just say, look, we've got a shoot coming up. Um, it's uh, Marshall Islands, or it's Antarctica, or it's uh, the Northern Lights, or it's Cuba. Uh, um, we're going, uh, we need to take a, a drone um, uh, uh, or and scuba gear. So sometimes we'd be um, lugging 35 cases around, mainly scuba mm. gear and um, mm. camera gear. But um, it's just, this is what they want. And so you just make it work. Yeah, wow. Mm. Um, epic. And yourself, you, you've actually become a drone pilot as well. We, we'll show some images soon. Um, that we've selected together. Um, but drone, drone use these days, has that become an imperative part of, of how you operate or, or get exclusive shots? Um, look, drones started for me, I think 60 Minutes um, wanted me to take a drone to Everest Base Camp in, I think it was 2013, so what's that, nearly 10 years ago. Mm. Um, and it was the first Phantom, it's in the garage actually, it was the first Phantom, uh, had a GoPro rigidly stuck to the bottom of it and before gimbals um so we took it up there and ever since then um everyone um pr- pretty much every single shoot you go on they say can we get a drone shot and um mm. um just actually you know just go with the flow and um i've just ended up buying you know you know the, it, whatever comes out i end up buying the like, latest mm. and greatest drone um yep. so i've got the mavic 2 at the moment the, mm. roger who came, came with me um to queensland last week had a mavic 3 which is pretty impressive and i've got a i've got an inspire too which i use a little bit but um um uh channel line put me through the you know the uh, drone um course so mm. which is you know, the repl or um, remote pilot license uh, pilots yeah. course uh and then end, end up having it a reoc operating certificate with casa mm. uh, so it's a bit of a fiddle to try and you know be able to do it legally mm. and, yeah and you need that um you need the um the license and the operating certificate to um to work for the ABC or Channel Line, for example, you can mm. you can fly a drone clearly, you know, as a hobbyist or um, uh, without a license, but li- limited to you know what you can do, whether you can get insurance. So um, it's a tricky thing, but you kind of have to have it. It's one of those little tools you have to have in your back pocket uh, to be able to pull out, a bit like a gimbal, you know, yeah. you have a drone, a gimbal, two or three cameras, some mic- and microphones, lots of lights. Must be hell to um, transport. Yeah, I've been one of these people who just keep keep trading in the uh, the old gear when when something new comes out. The R5C mm-hmm. came out, uh, so I sold my R5. The C500 came out, so I sold my C700. Mm-hmm. So I just keep upgrading to keep, have you know the most recent um, equipment, which um, is sort of you know 
expected really. Start, yeah, starting to help, I guess, and and having smaller and lighter setups and eventually, mm. you know, you can probably fit everything in one bag. I think that's kind of the direction we're going, which is really I guess exciting, especially for, for people like yourself who who are lugging a lot of that stuff around. Yep. Because it doesn't get any easier, that's for sure. No, um, no, you know, I, I'm trying to minimize how much gear I, I carry, and it's, it is a bit of a punish. And if I'm jet lagged and I can't sleep, but I, you know, I'll often close my eyes and rearrange pelican cases in in my head, um, <laughs> which is so boring that I fall asleep. So, um, uh, uh, instead of counting like, sheep, it's counting pelican yeah, exactly cases. Counting, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. Um, another thing as well that I would like to touch on. You've done some work with Sir David Attenborough, obviously quite a host of a host of names. Um, you've probably had an exclusive look about, well, regarding the landscape across the globe. Is that is conservation something that you've considered, um, or something that you've obviously worked with David Attenborough, who's very highly regarded? That he's already got obviously his views on on where we're heading. Um, have you got any thoughts there on 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 changes that? you've made or changes that we can make to, to help in that regard? Well, look, when you say uh, David Amber, I, I, I didn't actually, I don't know him. I didn't work with him, but I did, mm. I ended up, I shot an interview with him in, in his house in London in mm. between a trip to the Northern Lights and uh, a trip to Antarctica. Um, mm. So I've met him. Uh, he's a lovely yeah. bloke. Um, but I know Ray Martin, who's a good mate of mine, um, has spent a lot of time with him and, uh, you know, Clearly, he's you know I most I think Ray is actually one of the top three most uh, most incredible people he's ever met. Um, yeah. uh, conservation, I don't know. Look, you know, um, yeah, I think we should do what we can. I I um, you know bought a hybrid car car the other day, so um, I'm doing my best. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, is that something you've like? Have you gone to the same location twice and wondered? You know, it, it looks different in any regard, or there's, there's well, not there's that I can think of really. Or... Um, look, you know, clearly, you know, in Antarctica, you know, we were down there filming the leopard seals, which is a, mm. the apex predator down there, and you could see, you know, the guys who go down there frequently said the, you know, the um, the ice is melting, um, mm. the water is getting warmer, mm. um, uh, these little islands out in the Pacific, you know, they're obviously all, you know, all struggling. Um, I, I Look, you know, we've done a lot of stories um, about, you know, um, the environment, uh, yeah. you know, um, but I, I don't really, um, I don't really have a um, any sort of specific sort of advice, or uh, I mean, I'm interested in it, but I don't, I don't, I don't know what we do about it. Yeah, Apart for from sure. Buy, buy, you know, stop using. I mean, I'm, I'm just hooked on this, uh, this hybrid car. We don't use, I don't use petrol anymore, so I think that's a step forward. Yeah, for sure. I, I guess spreading awareness is is one very yeah. important tool, and that's something you've done anyway. Um, I suppose that's you know, what, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I, it's, as, part of what I do is is telling people stories, you know, mm. by mm. You know, through the pictures that we take, I guess, and that's I suppose my small part in doing you know lots of things that make a difference. But um, I don't have any more say than most people, or any more you know, sort of power or any any, um, any special. Um, you know, I've got no way of, I'm yeah. just a little guy with a camera, you know. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, another thing, Andy, we, we wanted to show, we'll start showing some photos as well um, while mm -hmm. we've still got some time here. So I'm just going to pull them up really quickly and we can probably have a bit of a chat about some of these images. So give me one second and I'll bring that up. So here we go. So this uh, might be channel... Channel Nine. Um, oh yeah, so that that, that one is um that's uh, a long time ago. That's um in that's Chile true. when the miners. I don't remember the miners are trapped underground. Oh um, yes, yep. Uh, we went there, went over there. God, there must have been. It have to be ten, no, ten, fifteen years ago. Mm. Um, look, it's actually just it's just a my little mini jib there that I used to have is um set up there, and we were doing a a, a piece to camera with Michael Usher there, who's a good mate of mine. Yep. Um, for sixty minutes, and we were craning up and down. You can see the big boulder there, um, and I was craning past the boulder and using that as a natural wipe so they could uh, transition into a graphic of what might be underground. So the graphics people oh, back wow. in Sydney would have a little more mind graphic, and, and it was a, just a natural wipe way of wiping through frame mm. uh, uh, to um, transition into the graphic. But, um, uh, yeah, it's um, – yeah. Oh yeah, yeah right. is that a, bit of a funny one. Yeah, this, yeah, this is another sixty-minute shoot with Will Ferrell in um, mm. in uh, California. 
and uh, it was funny. Like I'm a massive fan of, uh, as was Michael Usher, the reporter. Uh, we mm. um, yeah, we went 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 to a Pebble Beach and played golf with him, uh, and he um, I asked him to do a can I get a photo of you, um, you know, with you? And then, you know, he grabbed me by the face and I said, oh, you know, can you put me in a headlock and I'll get it? Anyway, so I've, I've tried that a few times. Uh, and uh, the Governor General wouldn't do it. I asked the Governor General once. All right. Time. Yeah, there's, most people say no. <clears throat> <laughs> no, that's awesome. And it's, and it's awesome to show that he's quite down to earth as well off screen. Um, Walkley Awards, um, this is something... From my research, correct me if I'm wrong. You've won five times. I think I think that's the sixth one actually. There you go. So this is um I think that, that was this year. Um, that's for the Lunar Park Ghost Train um doco on the ABC. Yep. Um, so look, you know, it's a normally a journalism award, and they have mm. one camera work category. Um, and um, over the years I've won it. I think six times. Basically, I'm, I'm kind of really, really kind of proud that I've won it. Um. For every show I've ever worked on, once for ABC News, once for um, Foreign Correspondent, once for Four Corners, uh, mm-hmm. once for 60 Minutes, once for Australian Story, um, and this one was for the, the Ghost Train Fire. So um, every kind of major show or production I've ever worked on has, um, yeah, paid off. Yeah, wow. um, we'll skip to the next one as well. Obviously, it might oh, be a little bit hard to see. That's the Crystal Caves in Mexico with, um, you know, there you go, zoom in. Yeah, look, yeah. these amazing caves down in um, uh, two and a half kilometres underneath the desert in mm. Chihuahua in Mexico, which uh, there are these uh, giant 14-metre crystals that What's grow in these crystals caves. Like clear quartz or something? I think they're gypsum, yeah, gypsum crystals, yeah, and they're 14 metres long and about a metre wide. Uh, it's 55 degrees Celsius in there, and I think that humidity is something like 99%. Um, <laughs> It's like walking into an oven. So we were, and we yeah. had these special suits. Um, uh, basically, these, uh, uh, you know, those guys that ride their um, so- cycles around. Is it latex? Um, um, <laughs> not latex, <laughs> but rubber. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, and they, they pump cold, cold, um, cold water around your body um, just to be able to survive. But um, yeah, that was that was that was probably one of the most incredible places I've, I've ever seen. And not many people have. I think we uh, and Nat Geo were yeah. the only crew that have ever been in there. Mm. Yeah, cool. Um, this is uh, I've done some research. That's, just a, that's a tsunami in Arche in two thousand and four. Yeah, yeah, that, that was bad. Yeah, crazy. we were wearing um, clearly you know, pre uh, we can't say the c word, but um, yeah. uh, pre the um last couple of, uh, we were wearing face masks because the smell of you know, it's just a lot of dead bodies there, um. Uh, and uh, a lot of yeah, the destruction was incredible. Mm. Uh, you know, it's uh, this is one of those stories we cover where it's um, you know it's a natural disaster, and there's not much you can do about them. But the more kind of um, uh, m- the more the most difficult shoots really are, are, are the ones where um, you know people are, are, are hurting other people. Like for example, mm-hmm. you know Rwanda or um, or the war in Bosnia. Um, you know, where people are killing their neighbours. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, this is a natural disaster. It's terrible, but um, um, yeah. Uh, this is some. Um, oh, this is the Hemsworth um, Shark Beach doco. Hemsy. Yeah, he's got my gear. He carried my tripod. Yeah, yeah. What a man. Yeah. That makes me. Oh, this is just last week. Actually, this is last week. This is in um. Out in what's called visit. Big Red, out at uh, yep. um, I think it's Bullia or um, yep, I've been there out in maybe? Simpson Desert, basically. Area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were shooting. This is my Inspire too. Um, I don't use it much, as I said, but there's a Ray mm. and, on this shoot with Ray and Ken Duncan, who's who's ah, yes, probably Australia's most you know mm-hmm. uh, famous uh, landscape photographer. Uh, mm. So this is a series called um, Chasing the Light. We've shot we shot one in Norfolk Island last year and this is one uh, out in the deserts for uh, tourism uh, queensland tourism um and uh it's well we just finished literally finished it yesterday so finished shooting yesterday so it should be out i don't know i think i think Qantas and sbs are running it in october brilliant mm. uh, is antarctic with ali yeah, yeah. ali and chico, chico uh, chick my sando what sort um, of what sort of degrees are we looking at here uh, look, you know what? Uh, that was it wasn't that bad uh, uh, on the boat. We went down this tiny mm-hmm. sailing boat. Um, we were scuba diving. Ali and I went sc- 
dry suit. It was a dry suit diving with leopard seals, the apex predator in Antarctica. Not you, yeah. There we go. There was right there. Um, and I don't. I know, I'm not much. I honestly don't know much about scuba diving at all. But um, these dry suits go blimey. Um, it's not, not cold, easy to man. operate in. Uh, but the t- water temperature is minus one degree Celsius um, and salt water freezes at one point, I think minus 1.5 or 1.8. So it was like beyond, beyond cold. So we jump in the water and um, film these leopard seals who um, see that guy, uh, I see that guy behind there. He um, he's on a Yeah. He, so he's the leopard seal expert. He wasn't okay. allowed in the water because they're so dangerous. He works for one of the you know universities in America. Yeah, so sure. he's not allowed in the water because um, they attacked and killed his, Colleague, like the year earlier. Wow. Mm. At what year is this one? Uh, probably 10 years ago. Yeah, wow. Well. Mm. Got some more. Yeah, that was drone, yeah. a pretty epic shot. The Mavic, what is it called? Uh, um, it's, um, Mavic 2. Fan, no, Phantom, the first Phantom. Mm. Mm. With a homemade uh, gimbal. I, I ordered it from China and strapped a GoPro to it. It was pretty, it was not very, it was, you know, it, it was good at the time, but yeah. You look a bit That's cautious. Highland PNG. Yeah, wow. That's uh, it's, uh, it's Ray. That's uh, that's at the ACS Awards. Uh, I think last year. Yeah, for another one for the Ghost Train uh, show, we we won an ACS award, well, yep. two or three actually. Wow. And how how instrumental has been working with someone like a, a Ray Martin or an Andy Denton? Has that Changed a lot of your oh, look, I haven't done. I, I look, I, I used to work a lot with Andrew Denton back in in the mm. studio uh, when he did shows like Blah Blah Blah. I did mm. an interview with him for uh, what was it called Enough Rope? Uh, yeah. Um, with uh, Share, but I haven't mm. haven't seen him for a long time. Um, but Ray, I shoot a lot of stuff with Ray. Um, yeah. uh, David Attenborough. Yep. That was just at his house, and that well, one David. one day we we met him in London. Yeah. I'm by no means mates, but Ray, you know, Ray is and. Uh, I think Ray's done 30 shows with him in Australia. Um, mm. Just uh, um, audio. Uh, and that's that next one is that's that's the day we were shot down in Af- in uh, Abkhazia, yes. uh, Afghanistan. I think in uh, Tarankout with the British uh, soldiers. I think they're uh, there's North Korea. Brilliant. Jeez. Afghanistan is this one? More Afghanistan, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, was, it was a promo for today's show. I shoot a lot, a lot of promos for Channel 9. Um, uh, just in the studio at Channel 9 there, yep. Um, Carlos. Carl, yeah, yep. He's a Queenslander. <laughs> cave again. That cave again? Yeah, uh, that's, that's Gallipoli a long time ago. Jeez. That's with Gary, Gary Tysers too. I don't know, I'm sure people will know Gary was the ABC chopper pilot for a long, long time. He mm. who, um crashed into Lake Air about, uh, must have been 10 years ago. It was the 18th of of, uh, of August. So mm. the anniversary was just up. I think it was probably about eight, maybe 11 years ago now. Mm. Not in that hit chopper. That was his own chopper, but it was an ABC squirrel. Mm. Uh, that's the first Gulf War. That's in um, Kuwait when Saddam blew up a British Airways jumbo jet. Mm. Tarmac. Mm. Took all the passengers hostage. Yes. Well, that's some um, great circle. images. Obviously, you've got quite a good um, show reel as well. Um, which, if anyone wants to have a look at that, obviously we'll we'll pop that up. Um, and your website, um, Andy, as well. That that's the video link. If anyone wants, to I think that's just, that's just for the video yeah, for the show reel. I think that's it. Yeah, uh, but it's yeah. on my website. Yeah, which is yeah. There you go. Um, you've got a website as well, Andy. If you want to, yeah, it's just one of those basic thing i just updated myself occasionally when i get new mm. gear or um yeah it's pretty pretty straightforward though yeah um amazing and touching on a bit about your life and your journey is there any moments where you've kind of stepped back a little bit pinched yourself and and enabled you to, to enjoy or look back on what you've done oh yeah most of the most most trips are you know yeah uh, yeah, they're all memorable, but um, yeah, yeah. geez, um, is there any that I'll... really stick out to you as as some of those moments where? Oh, look, the best ones. That, that Crystal Cave is incredible. Antarctica was yeah. amazing. Um, uh, North Korea. The places that most people don't get to go are the most, um, you know, the 
the, have the memories um, um, and and the experiences that you know I, I I'll sort of always remember. Um, yeah. yeah, if if, if it's uh, somewhere out of the way or uh, meeting people that you know that um, um, you know it's a bit it's just a privilege to to meet some of these people and to go to these places and, you know to be paid to do it um, mm. uh, is is not only fun it's just um, it's you know just um, so I'm, you know, just super, super, super privileged, and um, yeah. and um, um, I, I wouldn't mind doing more of it, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit um, as I get older, a bit, bit more uh, sick of travel, and um, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to stay, stay at home, and you know, work in in Sydney here as much as possible. But hmm. um, I guess the beauty of being freelance now is you can kind of pick. I can say, no, yeah, 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 yeah. But <laughs> yeah. I've been to, I think, uh, I think last time I counted was like 118 countries. So there's not too many places I haven't been. Um, so um, must be um, tough to plan your next holiday. Yeah, I'm going to Tassie next weekend. Yep. <laughs> How good is Tassie? Uh, yeah, very, very good. Um, last thing as well that maybe um, I'd like to touch on is for advice for, for someone who wants to follow in the footsteps of an Andy Taylor. I know um, just looking at a few helpful tips that you've posted in recent interviews as well, taking initiative, working hard, probably saying no to, 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 to opportunities when they present themselves. But uh, is there anything that kind of separates someone that, you know, is, is dabbling in this or wants to follow this full time? What sort of advice? Well, I think you? the most important thing is, is I think at, at, your attitude is, is as important, if not more important than in the near ability and your, you know, experience. So like mm. someone who's got a get, bit of get up and go is a fun person who, you know, um, is, is going to always going to do pretty well. Um, mm. You can't learn that really. Um, but um, I mean, Honestly, I think it's difficult. It is difficult to get in now, and every everyone's a videographer, or a cinematographer, or a cameraman, a director of photography, whatever whatever you want to call it. You've just got to mm. print a business card and put your name on. On the, it's it's you don't need any sort of special qualifications. Um, look, the two things that I think uh, help if you're kind of starting out. I think one is to um, get involved in the ACS, Australian Cinematographer Society. Their website is. Yep. Um, uh, cinematographer.org.au um, right. uh, and there's one in every every state we have awards yeah, and we have, uh, well. nights and uh, mag- there's a magazine and um, there's guys who are students there's kids who are um, you know 10 years old mm. a lot of news guys um, lots of guys who shoot commercials TV series Hollywood you know feature film um, so DOPs we've got five mm. five um, five uh, members of one uh Academy Award for cinematography. Mm. Um, so that's you know, that's a good start, a uh, good foot in the door. And um, there you go. Um, sure. And the other thing is just to try and try and attach yourself to a a, um, a crew or a production where you might be able to pick up ideas, even if you're hanging in the background, helping carry mm. gear, uh, working for nothing. Um, uh, and um, you know, you just you just meet people. You have a foot in the door, and then one thing may may lead to another. Um, yeah. You probably won't have to work for free for for a long, I don't think. Um, but it is hard to break in. It's a hard industry to break into because, you know, as I said, you don't need to do a, a formal, you know, tertiary, you know, course or um, um, have any specific qualifications to call yourself a cameraman or a sound recorder. Or you know, you just have to basically buy the gear and and mm. and knock on doors. Um, yeah. But 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 the. the some of the film courses that are out there are pretty good. The uh, film school uh, afters, you know, Australian Film Radio TV School. Mm-hmm. There, um, they kick, um, they spit out quite a few guys who do very very well. Um, it's a hard course to get into the cinematography course, mm-hmm. um, and there's a lot of other like uh, uh, camera uh, cinematography courses in in um, around at least in Sydney. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it is it's hard to break in. I, I don't really. I don't know how, how, you know, it'd be difficult for me. It was, um, to me, it was just getting a job as a news cameraman and that taught me how to, um, you know, do the basics and work in a hurry, um, Mm. you know, get on with people and working overseas, um, had to edit my own material. So, um, you know, shoot a story, go back into the edit suite, tape to tape, you know, um, working till midnight. Uh, and I used to learn, taught myself very quickly, how much I needed to shoot where, mm. um, you know, and how it's it, when you start editing, editing your own material, it is a very, very mm. good way of, um, 
of of teaching yourself very quickly how to um how to how to piece together it all yeah. Yeah. yeah from start to finish because you know what you're kind of looking for in advance i mm. assume as well mm. um andy it's been a pleasure um absolute pleasure to hear your story and thank you for sharing um some great moments in your career um and and it's just been an absolute pleasure um I'll, I'll let you go. Um, I know you're quite a busy man yourself. Um, I've got a quiet week this week. Oh, you've got a quiet week? Yeah. yeah. Put, put the feet up, watch the AFL finals maybe. Uh, um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andy, thanks, thanks again for joining us. It's been an absolute treat. Um, for anyone tuning in as well um, to, that wants to know what we're doing um, for, coming up, we've got Peter Eastway who is a, a landscape photographer, and that's going to be on Tuesday the 6th of September. Same time, same place. Um, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell as well if you want to stay in tune on what we've got coming up. Um, but I believe we're going to show a little video um, on what we've got for, for plan for Peter in our, our next one. Thanks for joining again, guys. See you later.